Frederick Taylor was the high priest of scientific management, and he's certainly somebody that you should delve into, read a biography or two, and you will find probably the principal architect of the world you live in. In the past, Frederick Taylor wrote, he was the uh, scientific management engineer for the Carnegies and the Rockefellers. In the past, Frederick Taylor wrote, man has been first. By the way, he also invented the slip-on shoe because it was more efficient than a shoe that had to be tied. Uh, in the past, Frederick Taylor wrote, man has been first. In the future, system must be first. The thought processes of the standardized worker had to be standardized too in order to render him a dependable consumer. Forget efficiency in production if you can't get efficiency in consumption. Now think about that for just a short instant. The most efficient consumption system would have people consuming all the time and expending all their earnings and all their savings on consumption. Have I described the United States at the beginning of the 21st century, but the only way you can get continuous consumption is by maintaining a constant low level of boredom so that nothing people buy is satisfactory for other than the first few moments after the purchase. Think only of your computer, which you know even if you bought it today as you listen to me, is already obsolete because none of the computer companies would release a generation of computers if they didn't already have the replacement generation in hand. Read Tracy Kidder's The Soul of a New Machine and find out where that philosophy evolved from. At the minute the sales curve for whatever the, the you know, the AC Ducey machine you bought is, whenever the sale curve reaches, is that called the asymptote, David, the top, and starts down, at that moment, the drums begin to roll for the generation that was available at the moment you purchased this generation. And it is tooled up and moved on to scene. Of course, its replacement, too, stands in the wings waiting for, for you to continuously consume and be dissatisfied with this machinery. The same thing's true of automobiles. It's true of everything because that's the logic of scientific management. You have to reach a point in human life where everything and anything machines make will be consumed enthusiastically. Well, they make an awful lot of stuff. Fortunately, the United States of America is there to consume it. Uh, chap th that, that's the end of uh, the third part of the book. The fourth part of the book is simply one chapter. It's a personal interlude about my own family and upbringing in a coal mining town in western Pennsylvania. And if you had taken my family and put them under modern social work scrutiny, this is both my father's family and my mother's family, I would have grown up in social service work in a foster home and all of the people I knew who were all wonderful wacky geniuses who fought constantly they would have all been locked up and if I were the victim of those things that I'm told victimize people when I read the, the, the various child saving manuals then I would not have been able to live an adult life, to own a farm, to become the New York State Teacher of the Year, to write four books, and to make a movie, to be married to the same woman after 43 years. 
The truth is like schooling, our insight into, into the mind of the developing young, A, is based on averages. Even the averages are suspect there. I suppose I can't tell you that I believe that spare the rod and spoil the child is probably as accurate, as accurate a, a piece of folk wisdom as anything else. It's not 100% accurate, but certainly was accurate in, in, in my place. Nor do I look at anyone who applied the rod to my anatomy with anything other than love and gratitude. All right, that was my Green River. And, and why I throw that in is not uh, for some personal display, but simply to show a personal contradiction to, to sociological wisdom and psychological wisdom as it's been packaged and, and vended to us. Uh, Part four of the book is called Metamorphosis. I try to show the change from an earlier traditional libertarian society. It's interesting because that's almost a contradiction in terms. We hardly have a record of a libertarian society in the West or the East. Where the models came from were American Indian tribes who didn't have a ladder of authority the way Hollywood shows with the top guy having all the feathers in his hat. But very often the chief ships were exchanged. They were drawn by lot. And if that sounds bizarre to you, let me tell you that all of the leading positions in classical Greece were drawn by lot. If you wouldn't put your name in the hat or whatever container they use, then you weren't fit to be a citizen of Athens. And if they needed a water commissioner, all the citizen names were available. And the one they drew out was the water commissioner. And how about general of the armies? Exactly the same way. Not a professionalized lifelong career, but it was assumed that a citizen would have the competency to do anything after a short trial period. And that to be a citizen, you had to have a crack at all the major responsibilities. Otherwise, you weren't worth dealing with. You were a slave. I think that might be a fresh perspective on the 21st century.